Welcome to Head Heart Homefront, brought to you by the Barry Robinson Center, the country's leading behavioral health residential treatment center for military kids. I'm your host, Erin Lindstrom, and I'm so glad you're here. The Barry Robinson Center created this interview series to celebrate Military Family Month. We're bringing together mental health leaders to chat about building resiliency and healthy, happy families through the ups and downs of military life. We know military life can be challenging, for our kids, and it can also present amazing opportunities. In these conversations, we talk about tips, tools, and techniques to navigate the highs and lows for both you and your children. The conversations have been incredible, and we are so excited to share this episode with you. Hey, I'm Erin Lindstrom, and welcome back to Head, Heart, Homefront. I am incredibly excited for this conversation. I have Amanda Yoder with me. And before we hop in, we, um, I would love to share a little bit about her with you. So Amanda Yoder is one of two military connected school counselors with Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Her primary roles are to support military students and families experiencing transitions such as moving and deployment, deployment, and to train and support school division staff on military issues. In part due to her own military background as a combat veteran, Amanda has a diverse and extensive understanding of the challenges that military families face. In her seven years of working with military students and families, she's identified the most common areas of need, developed many support strategies, and provided professional development to thousands of educators and parents around the country. Amanda, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Erin. Yeah. So I would love to know, obviously, I just read your bio. So we have like the nuts and bolts of like who you are and what you're up to. But if you're open to sharing, I'd love to hear about like your journey to getting to this place. Like, tell us who are you and how did you get here? Um, so my journey is kind of interesting. I was not a military child, but I did move a lot due to my um, dad's job. And so I can relate a lot to students and families that are experiencing that. Then I went into the military myself um, after high school. And then after I got out of the military, I became a financial counselor and ended up going back to school for a school counseling degree, um, which is what brought me to Virginia Beach. And this role just could not have been more perfect for my experience. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, so school counseling, what brought you to that? Um, I think the fact that school counseling is a one trusted adult for a lot of people. Sometimes it's a teacher, sometimes it's an aunt or an uncle, um, but for a lot of students, the school counselor, and for me, it was my school counselor that I could go to and trust um, with some life issues who was able to both listen and give me um, a nudge in the right direction when I needed it. And so I hope to um, join, I wanted to join the profession that does that for so many other students now. Amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about um, this kind of mixing of the two worlds, right, from like military and then being in public schools in Virginia Beach? Can you tell us a little bit about that crossover and why, why is it important that we sort of like, right, or even acknowledging the crossover that exists? So I think it's very important um, in a lot of areas, but especially an area like ours that's heavily concentrated with military. Um, we are everywhere um, to the point that you could overlook us, um, but we are, you know, a, a solid 20 to 30 percent um, of the region that is active duty, um, and then higher numbers with veteran and, and retiree populations. And so while the the students and the families have, you know, all the normal challenges and strengths that that non-military families experience, um, they also come with their own unique challenges, whether that's because of deployment, because of being away from extended family, um, because of moving more often, but those strengths that also come out of that are important for us to highlight and make sure that we um, support students and families, but also that we use the strengths that they bring to strengthen our whole community. Mm, I love that. Can you talk a little bit about like the ways that you support military families inside of the schools? Yeah, so in Virginia Beach, there are two of us, myself and Star Wiggins, who work with military families in transition. So in addition to the military's branches, um, school liaison officers, we have a 
in-depth level knowledge of Virginia Beach City Public Schools so we can help families connect with exactly who they need to connect with, get them an understanding of our programs. Sometimes they are moving into the area um, and they may have a student, especially in the secondary level where we need to make sure that the credits are going to line up, keep them on track for graduation, make sure that they get access to our academies or specialty programs similar to students that were already here, um, and just trying to mitigate those um, opportunities make sure that the opportunities aren't lost in transition. That makes sense. So really making sure that like, yeah. as the, the um, stepping stones of the journey are kind of coming together, that they actually fit, right? So if we're changing school districts um, and starting a path in one place, you're kind of, sounds like connecting those two paths together. Absolutely. And we try really hard also to make sure that we set families up when they're leaving us. So mm. um, Star and myself have both become very good at learning other states graduation requirements and trying to make sure families are as well versed at when we give them a warm handoff as possible. Um, they're, they're all ours, whether they're coming or going, in my opinion. Oh, that is such a good point. I think we're always focused on like the new start. But wow, having someone to actually support the ending, like that's an incredible way of thinking about it. That really is constantly setting you, set, setting you up for success with whatever that next step is. Yeah, we, a couple of you, when this started as part of a Dodea grant, um, we looked at a couple different things and we saw there was a lot of attention around new students that were arriving and new families and that's good. It was a good starting point, but we also realized that the students that were leaving um, needed that warm handoff to be successful at their next school. So we focused a lot of attention around that for, for years in training. Um, and, and many of those families will cycle back through us as well. And so, you know, the better that we can prepare them to leave we hope that next school prepares them to leave and, and therefore come to us better. Um, but also, we also have a population of military families that don't move. Um, and so we've, we've tried to make sure that we're incorporating their needs that might be unique to staying here. Um, they may be the person that's always left behind by the families that are leaving. <laughs> and so kind of we have a three-wheeled graphic that we, or three-gear graphic we show, and we try to make sure we're hitting all those those um, populations. Oh, I just kind of got chills because you just said something that's never really been pointed out to me before, which is, so my kids are military connected. Their dad and stepmom are both enlisted in the Navy. And we've been here for seven years. So they haven't actually moved. And it's been, I'm kind of like, oh, see, like <laughs> we have the, the other side of this. However, they have definitely dealt with the grief of their friends leaving and being like, well, where did they go? Why are they gone? And I've never really considered like that piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so while students and families can have a lot of strengths by being in one place and they have maybe a peer network, um, they still experience those things. And so we've we've tried to do some training and awareness raising to help families um, be aware of that and support their own kids and also help the school system um, staff members support kids for that too. Wow. And so when you talk about support, um, obviously, because we're talking about the school system too. So there's going to be a level of like academic support and making sure that all of their ducks are in a row in that capacity. Can you talk to us a little bit about like the emotional support? Um, and is that part of something that's at play as well? Yeah, so for our for our emotional support, all of our school counselors, um, which we are, you know, we have some wonderful school counselors in every single building. There's at least one, and in, in many buildings, there's many more than one. Um, and they are there for the students' social emotional needs in addition to their academic needs. We also have um, 60 of our 86 schools have military family life counselors that are contracted through OSD. Um, so those are available to meet with families and students as well. They do a lot of work around. Um, deployment, grief, moving, as well as organizational or just, you know, um, attention, any of the things you might struggle with as a, as a typical student, mm -hmm. um, socially, emotionally, or a little bit of academics. Um, and we also partner really strongly with um, multiple organizations, such as the Barry Robinson Center, such as the Cohen Clinic, um, give an hour focus, and, and any other resources that we need to refer families to, um, to make sure that they're getting their mental health needs met at a star and I have the background. Unfortunately, we don't do a lot of that with there just being two of us for the division, but we do right. make sure families get connected to the best resource. Oh, that's so smart. And I love the, I think it can be so helpful to just have someone who knows the world and what is available. <laughs> like so, those people are so, so, so key. Um, so for people who may be listening and are like, oh, 
Right. Guidance counselors. Like for me, this never really popped in my mind as someone to actually go to and like build a relationship with inside of school for my kid's success. Can you talk a little bit about like how to get started with that relationship or tips you would kind of like give families who are listening and they're like, oh yeah, I should see what's there. Quick terminology correction. We are known as school counselors. The guidance counselor term kind of went out um, 15, 20 years ago. It's what we all know growing up with comfort wise, but it was really somebody who was focused on those tracks and getting students, you know, into specific pathways for after high school. And our job is so much more than that. Now we have the training in social and emotional support um, in, in, friendships and relationships, um, the academics, but also career and not tracking kids um, and opening doors and making sure that we're helping students um, close gaps instead of, you know, well, you're already on this path and and there's no hope, um, as sometimes happened in the old model. And so it is, and now we exist all K-12, so sometimes elementary school wasn't a place that we thought of a school counselor, and now they are forward thinking and building in the social emotional learning, the language of your feelings and identifying them and how much strength that brings. They're teaching your students those, those lessons, and so, and then they're doing small group and individual work, and it continues through middle and high school, adding in the academic components. And so a great way to reach out to your child's school counselor is just to shoot them an email. Um, ask them, you know, what what is, if they don't have a newsletter that already informs you of some of the things they're doing, ask them what they're doing and how you can reinforce that, that at home um, with your students is a great way to build that relationship. Wow. That's incredible. Thank you so much for taking the time too, like for just that education moment of guidance counselor versus school counselors, because I think so many of us have grown up in a world, right? Where it was guidance counselor and you just kind of like opening up um, and really sharing about like all the differences. And it sounds like there's been a big change just as far as like how we're looking at kids and their tracks and really like opening up that you're supporting. And so, yeah. And what like an incredible player to be on your child's team to kind of see things bigger than just like go to college, do the thing. It's not about checking boxes. It sounds like it's really about getting to know the child and like what their needs are and meeting them there. Absolutely. And that is one of our key components is meeting each child where they're at, identifying their needs, um, and, and determining, you know, is, is that once a month lesson, you know, enough for some students? Sure. Other students are going to need more reinforcement through small groups. Some students want to bring us individual circumstances and, and we respect and, and meet all those needs the best that we can. Amazing. So for families who maybe have a child who's like struggling right now or not showing some signs or symptoms of like things aren't necessarily as good as they can be, right? We all want our children to be thriving. Um, And if that's not happening, if they're struggling or showing signs of struggle, um, do you have any tips or techniques or things that you would recommend um, parents do in order to help like get them back on track? So that's a wide open question, but definitely I'll start with some broad strokes and and say that the most important thing is to make sure that your child is safe and secure. Um, We have a saying, we say Maslow before Bloom, Maslow's hierarchy of needs needs to be met before you're really going to engage with academic work. And so that may be their their physical safety, it may be a comfort level. It may be that they're just out of their routine. It may be that they need some socialization. There's a lot of different needs. um, And so it's hard to speak to that broad category, but to start with identifying what's missing and it may be routine, it may be structure, it may be an opportunity. um, I know for a lot of families with the virtual learning, finding a learning space that's conducive. Um, It may be making sure they have some control in their life. So typically when students go to school, parents, you know, don't see them all day and aren't involved in every lesson. And so it may be that they need a little trifold and there's some time that you let them struggle a little bit or know that they will ask for help rather than, being there at every single click. Um, Obviously our little ones need that constant attention, but some of the older students I think are starting to experience, when do I get a chance to feel like I have some sense of control? So it may be decorating the trifold that you give them that gives them a whole new sense of purpose Um, or letting them have a Zoom lunch with their friends you know, outside of the class setting during lunch or a FaceTime or whatever, um, where they're getting that socialization without as much 
parental involvement as as they might have um, seen lately. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think kids do, especially in this time of virtual schooling, that there's a lot more independence, it seems, when the kids are going to school, right? (laughs) And we don't even, as parents, know exactly what's happening or how they're flowing through the day. And so we're faced with this, like, conundrum now of, like, how to support, and we're kind of all relearning what does that look like, right? Absolutely. And so I I start with that to say some creative ideas to start, but also I want to make sure to mention that if your child's showing behavior signs that are not, you know, in line with their typical behavior, you you need to know when to seek peer support and when to seek professional support. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you, if you reach out to your child's school counselor is a great starting point of, you know, here's some of the behaviors I'm seeing, what are your suggestions, implement those. If it's, if we see those red flags, we're going to let you know, you know, this might be time to um, get them in to see someone and, and it may be that they need, you know, a, a therapy appointment, a medication change, um, or that they just needed some organizational tools. So it's a good starting point. Love that. Um, thank you. Is there anything else that you feel like you would want military families, military parents um, who are listening to really know? I think what I would want anyone to take away right now in this time of high stress is remember that relationships are the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And to take that moment, um, that mindful moment, that self-care first, you know, the old oxygen mask analogy, you really have to take care of yourself and then take care of those around you. And sometimes that means that, you know, certain things are going to fall by the wayside. I heard a beautiful analogy recently that, um, you know, we're all juggling a lot of balls and that some are glass and some are plastic and you got to know what the really important ones are and tend to those first and the rest you can pick up and start again from. Yes, I I have chills again because I just heard that for the first time the other day too. (laughs) But it's so true. And you know, it's interesting, especially with the um, putting your oxygen mask on first. I think for parents, we kind of know that and it can be hard because we're taking care of everyone. But I think that's a lesson that we need to be passing down to our kids too. And it's not one that we usually sit down to teach them, but so much of this comes back to helping them take care of themselves, right? Absolutely. Do you have any, um, I don't know if there's anything just around that as far as like when we, when we think about like self-care for kids, obviously that can mean like so many different things, but as far as like where to start or just a tiny thing you can start to do, especially when we are so interested in building relationships, like what could that look like on a day-to-day basis? I think um, the first thing is for people to start to get to know themselves, whether you're an adult or a, or a child, your first starting point is encouraging them to know themselves. So encouraging them to know, you know, does playing music calm me down or not? Does playing basketball calm me down or not? Um, does it, if I give you the hand, is that give me a minute to compose myself and, and not take it disrespectfully? Or, you know, is that a sign that I need help? You know, but we need to learn what our, what we respond to as individuals. So to encourage your kids to get to know what is, you know, also their triggers, but especially how do you calm yourself? What is helpful for you? And identifying and then reminding them to use those strategies. Oh, I love that. The the curiosity really about like who we are and kind of holding your kids through that. Again, I just think it's so fascinating because this is so important and we're always focused on like colors, numbers, right? And then we're looking at their grades and like all of the achievement stuff. And to me, it sounds like so much of what this comes back to is the being stuff and really making sure like they're grounded and how can we support them in being grounded so that no matter where they're going, which path or which school or which transition, like they know who they are and they can continue to evolve as they go. Exactly. So just like we think about in the workforce with transferable skills, that's what we want to think about for our kids. If we teach them the skills of how to build a relationship and how to self-care and how to have resiliency, which is built and not innate, um, but as they learn more about themselves and they invest in relationships, the the academics will follow. Um, You know, it's not the easiest thing. Teachers and, and students certainly work at that. But once you have those skills, the rest can come along. Just like if you hire someone with the right job traits, um, they don't have to have the technical knowledge. You can teach that then. Yes. Oh, that is such a good analogy. 
Well, Amanda, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for your service. Thank you for sharing your time and energy. This has been such a good conversation uh, and I really, really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Head, Heart, Homefront, a production from the Barry Robinson Center, the country's leading behavioral health residential treatment center for military kids. Many times, kids with behavioral and mental health issues don't improve with typical treatment options in their community. Families may need to consider long-term residential care, and this is where the Barry Robinson Center excels. They're a mission-focused nonprofit organization based in Virginia. Their residential center is the only one in the country that works exclusively with military kids. They understand the military community as many of their employees are military connected. Their high quality treatment includes a wide range of services to help improve the lives of children. If your child needs additional support, check out barryrobinson.org. Navigating mental health can be challenging and we want you to know that you do not have to do it alone. Thank you so much for listening to Head Heart Homefront. If you've enjoyed this episode, please let us know with a five-star review if you're listening to the podcast or a like, comment, or share if you're listening on Facebook or YouTube. Until next time, be well.